in thinking that just because you have the ability to stand in a pulpit and preach that that makes you somehow a Christian. It does not. So be true to God. Number two, be true to the text. And we've been teaching you that here at Arise. How to study the Bible for yourself. How to know what the text is teaching and what the text is not teaching. Okay? Be true to the text. Whatever the text says, preach that. Don't, don't bring some fanciful, speculative conjecture to the text and preach that. Preach the text. Okay? So be true to the text. Number three, be true to yourself. And what we mean by that is be the person that God has called you to be. Many of us are not comfortable in our own skin. And the reason that we're not comfortable in our own skin is we are, I suppose there's a variety of reasons, but one of them has to be that we live in such a media-saturated environment that many of us, like the mob that we were talking about earlier, all making our decisions together, many of us want to be like the people on television. Right? We want to be like them. We want to talk like they talk or look how they look or whatever it is. We want to be something other than we are. And part of Christian maturity is settling into the person that you are. Part of Christian maturity is settling into the person you are, the sanctified person that you are. Being comfortable with the size of your nose, being comfortable with the unique uh, perspective that you bring, being comfortable in your own skin, your own armor. Okay? And, and I don't know of any other way to do that more successfully and more profoundly than being a true follower of Jesus because then you have inherent value. You have inherent worth. You don't have to be anything else because you are the only you available to God. You don't have to aspire to be this movie star or this sports star or anything else. You are who God has made you to be and you should be. By the way, half of those people aren't who you see. In fact, I'm, I am persuaded, and I, I say this with a little bit of trepidation because I don't know if there's any evidence for it, but I am in my own mind persuaded that there is a connection, a causal connection between acting and movie stars and mental instability in the life of a person. Because when you spend your whole life being other people and being that person as authentically as you can, whether in front of a television camera or a movie camera or on the radio or whatever, you spend your whole life being other people, how do you then remember who you are? And these people are the best at it. They're, they are so good at it that they can convince us in movie after movie or television show after television show that they're not really that person that they were in the last movie where they were the absent-minded professor. Now they're the renegade lawyer hero guy. Well, don't tell me that at some level that doesn't begin to impact them and affect them in their own lives remembering, okay, exactly who am I? If you spend your whole life pretending, it's going to be difficult to remember who you actually are. So these are not people to emulate. This is not something to emulate. Become comfortable in your own skin with who you are. You know, don't be a hypocrite. That's the word that Jesus frequently used. The word hypocrite comes from Hippocrates. It means to be an actor. Okay, settle into your skin. It's a sign of Christian maturity. And so be true to yourself. Figure out who you are. Now, some of you are kids. You know, Amanda and Alyssa and others of you here, Steve, you're 17, you're 18 years old. But even at 17, 18, and 19 years old, you can be a mature person. Does that make sense? You can be a mature person. You don't have to be all giddy reading Seventeen magazine and all this foolishness. You can be a mature person. Even if you're not mature in numbers of years, you can be a mature person in your stability and solidity of character in Christ. Amen? Amen? And finally, be true to life. And what we mean by that is, at some point, your sermon that you're going to preach here, for example, and any subsequent sermon that you will preach, at some point, that sermon has to land in the living room. At some point, it has to land in the workplace. At some point, that sermon has to land in the bedroom. It has to land in the kitchen. If all you're preaching is this sort of do-do-do-do-do philosophy up here, and isn't this interesting, and speculation, and the nature of God, and how God relates to time, and it's all speculative, and it's all philosophy, if it doesn't have any legs to where it actually touches the terra firma, who cares? Now, don't get me wrong. You're looking at somebody who's very philosophically and... and uh, theologically minded. So I don't mind discussing those kinds of things. But there's a difference between discussing them and then standing up and preaching them for people who may not share your bent to philosophy or to theology. You have to spell it out. This is what we've learned from the text of Scripture. This is what it meant. This is what it means. This is how we can apply it. Here are some instances of application. Some instances of what, everyone? Application. application. So be true to life. Land that sermon in the bedroom. Land that sermon in the kitchen. Land that sermon in the workplace. Land that sermon in real life. Draw those lines. Don't assume that other people will draw the lines, okay? If it's just an exposition of what was, 
Many people will not make the application. And this is where a great many sermons fail. They are theologically true, they are biblically true, they are biblically accurate, but where is the modern contemporary application? You should have learned some truths, you should have learned some principles, you should have learned something that you can then tie to modern culture. Because if you're having trouble as the preacher making those connections, well, then think about the congregation. If you, who've been thinking about the sermon all week or all month, have not been able to make those connections effectively, don't think the person who's just sat down and listened to you for 45 minutes on Sabbath morning that they're going to make the connections. No, 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 no. You have to not only study what Scripture says, you have to meditate and think and make the connections to real life. Perhaps more than any other preacher that I personally know, and I don't know a lot of them, but of the ones that I know, Matt Para is the very best at this. He will take some obscure, amazing insight that had never even dawned on me. That's one of the things I love about Matt. The way he preaches, he makes me feel like I've never even read the passage that he's preaching on. Have you had that experience? You're like, whoa, did he? But it's not just these insights, which are great, but then it's the application. It's the, it's the application. So I like to say, put some feet on your faith and put some legs on your lesson. Okay? Put, make them touch the ground. Make them touch the ground. Okay? So, be true to God, be true to the text, be true to yourself, and be true to life. That's preaching. We together, everyone? See, this is such a difficult class to teach because I feel like I could stop at any point and we've already accomplished it. But there's still some sort of details that some of you will benefit from. So let's talk about those. We've talked about the messenger's commitment, the meaning's correctness, and now let's talk about the message's content. This will be a little bit of the nitty-gritty of how to actually write a sermon, so to speak. Um, if a message isn't true to the text, it isn't a good sermon no matter how well it may be delivered. Okay? You might say all the right things in terms of your delivery, but if it's not biblical, who cares? Okay? So be sure first and foremost that the message is true to the text. True to what, everyone? Yeah. True to the text. Here we go. So you've got to learn how to study Scripture responsibly first, and you don't have to be a scholar or an academic to do this. One of my very favorite statements from the pen of Ellen White, fifth volume of the Testimonies, page 331. I love this. The Bible with its precious gems of truth was not written for the scholar alone. Now, you've heard this quotation here before. So I'm going to ask you this question, and you're all going to get it right. Was the Bible written for the scholar? Okay, most of you are going to get it right. Was the Bible written for the scholar? Yes. But was it written for the scholar alone? No. There we go. On the contrary, it was designed for the what kind of people? The common people. And the interpretation given by the what kind of people? Any common people here today? Me too. The interpretation given by the common people when aided by the Holy Spirit accords best with the truth as it is in Jesus. The great truths necessary for salvation are made clear as the noonday and none will mistake and lose their way except those who follow their own judgment instead of, a, instead of the plainly revealed Word of God. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Absolutely. The Bible was written for just ordinary people like us. Now, having said that, there are essential tools for responsible Bible study, many of which we've already talked about in here, but let's just go over them again quickly. Not less than three excellent Bible translations. Okay, So not less than three good translations of Scripture. The reason for this is you're not a... Greek scholar, I'm not a Greek scholar. You're not a Hebrew scholar, I'm not a Hebrew scholar. So, in looking at numerous different versions when we're preparing our sermon, this helps us to see the variations that are possible in translations of a given passage. Okay? And what I would recommend you do is you choose at least one, preferably two, from the, the end of the spectrum. Remember we drew our spectrum up here? Word for word, thought for thought, right? Literal, dynamic. Choose two from this end of the spectrum, and one down here is fine. So for me, that happens to be... Well, for me, I just love lots of translations. But right now, I'm reading through the New International Version, which is more toward this end of the spectrum, toward the thought for thought. I'm enjoying it. Um, but for me, the, my go-to Bibles are New King James and the ESV. Those are my two go-to Bibles, New King James and ESV. But I'll read the NIV at times, or even a looser paraphrase. I've just... Uh, finished read, reading large sections of the Phillips translation of Scripture, the paraphrase. So get yourself several translations. Number two, a clear thinking, logical, and creative mind. And I know you also, I know you bring that to the table, okay? Um, number three, a surrendered, humble, and pliable will, okay? Be ready and desirous to bring a willingness to obey whatever it is that you discover to the table, okay? We've said before, I will is more important than I... 
I will is more important than IQ. Jesus says in John 7, 17, if any man willeth to do my will, he shall know of the doctrine. If you are first willing, if you are first willing, then you will know uh, the, the correct doctrine according to Jesus. Um, a reasonably quiet place. I use the word reasonably here because um, many of you have noisy roommates and others of you have noisy spouses and children and those kinds of things. So a reasonably quiet place, get yourself a dictionary, an exhaustive Bible concordance or a computer program that does the same so that you can look up other usages of the word in question. Uh, a lay-friendly Greek and Hebrew definitions book, which probably the very best way to do this nowadays is just to get a computer program for most of you. Um, I've had several people ask me what program I use. I use eSword, but actually I somewhat regret that in this sense. I use eSword, but I have to have this Windows program on my Macintosh in order to use it. I apologize. Um, but uh, the very best Bible program that you can get for Macintosh, if you're going to buy a new one, they're not terribly expensive, is a program called Accordance. Accordance. Go ahead, T. What's it called? Logos. Oh, is it good? Oh, it's hands down. Well, is it, it's, is it the Logos that has been available for PC for years and years and years? Yeah, they, they Bible works. For Windows yeah, yeah, that's quite a good program as well. Right. So Accordance, Logos, whatever program you personally choose, um, that's increasingly the, the best way to get access to some of these kinds of materials, okay? These are what are called lexicons, a Greek and a Hebrew lexicon. Get yourself an excellent Bible dictionary um, or two, it's fine. Um, the writings of Ellen White, especially the Conflict series, which is basically her commentary on Scripture, and a couple reputable conservative commentaries. Okay, and again, the easiest way to get that, rather than trying to travel around with all these dozens of books, is to get yourself a Bible program. Okay, so these are some basic Bible study tools. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to step over here just quickly and fast forward through this section because we've already gone through the whole telescope and microscope thing. Remember that? In our How to Study the Bible class, the telescope helps us to see the big picture. The microscope helps us to see the small picture. So sometimes when I deliver this presentation, I've not gone through that. And so I just talk about some principles of Bible study. Okay, but since we've been through that in this class, I'm just going to fast forward through that. See, the second part there, we've already talked about if a message isn't true to the text, it isn't a good sermon no matter how well it may be delivered. Second thing here then, so you've got to first learn how to study the, study the Bible, study Scripture responsibly. And you don't have to be a scholar or an academic to do this, as many of you are already figuring out. You're, you're getting into the text of Scripture. I've really enjoyed it. I've not been able to make all of the worships in the morning or even most of them, but the ones that I've heard have really ministered to my soul. Really ministered to my soul. In fact, Michael's worship, that was what, last week? That was just superb. It just spoke right to my, right to my being. And so um, many of you are already learning this. Now, here's a, a very basic, basic outline for a sermon. And when I say basic, I mean basic. Um, we could call this the KISS method. Some of you have heard, keep it simple, stupid. I prefer keep it simple, saint. Okay, a little less uh, um, uh, strong there. So, so very simply, you just start off with an introduction or a story, something that uh, will grab the attention of people, okay? Now, I'm not much of a storyteller, as you've probably learned. I'll occasionally tell a story in my sermon, but there are some people who who are very good storytellers, and they really incorporate various stories into their sermons, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I have no aversion to telling a story as long as it's my own story. I don't like going to whatever sermon stories or sermonillustrations.com or some of this kind of thing, you know, and telling the story about the golden retriever, and I just, that's not me. You know, it's just not, I just can't be like, there was a little boy, and he had three golden retrievers. And I just, I can't, I, I feel funny even doing that. That was the scariest thing ever. <laughs> I, feel, I feel funny even doing that now because for me, if I'm going to tell a story, it has to